Thanks very much. Um, first, we're going to see if there are any questions specifically for you, and then we'll have the other two faculty members come up for um, questions for the whole panel. Okay, um, any questions? Okay, well, if Steve and Michael could come back to the front, please. Any questions now? Oh, come on. You guys haven't been shy yet. Here, okay, thank, thanks, and I'll get right to you. Yes, um, I had a question from Michael. Um, I know that in your presentation you mentioned that you started to see a decline in the quality of the scholarship you were receiving or a decline in maybe journals being submitted. Now that you've gone to open access, have you noticed a change in the kinds of scholarship your journal is receiving? Uh, because it, it's it's fairly early um, in the process. I, I don't have any empirical evidence of that. However, we, we now have an opportunity to kind of change the way that we present our journal as a, a potential receptacle for really good scholarship. Uh, and I think the most compelling uh, case we can make to find scholars to publish in our journal is that someone's going to read it. It's getting into the classroom. Your article will be downloaded. It can be searched individually. Um, we can we can guarantee. I mean, I'll show them the number of the, you know the first ten months of downloads. And uh, if someone were telling me that I had an opportunity to have an exposure to potentially hundred thousand downloadable online journal, I want to be published in that journal. So, um, if you invite me back in a year, maybe I can throw you some empirical evidence that in fact we have increased the quality of the of the scholarship. I, I will. Um, and of course, we'll measure that by the number of manuscripts that we receive and our acceptance rate, uh, which currently is uh, currently is at about sixty uh, about a sixty percent acceptance rate. So we, we hope to see that as sort of a penultimate uh, transformation, um, not simply distribution or wide dissemination, but that that we really are the journal for top-notch scholarship. Uh, that has something to do with uh, our area of specialty. So that's that's the, the real question that I hope we'll have uh, a favorable answer to in the next year or so. Okay. Well, I have a question about society membership while you all are collecting your thoughts and coming up with another question. Um, Kent, we just heard from Steve that his society's student membership is really increasing. But um, one thing I hear from society publishers, a concern they have about open access is that students and postdocs and new entrants into their professions will not feel a need to be a society member if they can get all of the journal content, either open access or even through an institutional subscription. Um, would you like to comment on that? On behalf yeah, I, Go yeah ahead. I'd be happy to, because I have experience with several societies, actually. And, and so I have to say, the Botanical Society of America is, a, is like Steve's society. The Botanical Society of America, our student memberships are doing extremely well. But the reason they're doing extremely well is because they cost almost nothing. We charge our students only $15 a year, $10 a year if they renew early, and they they have access to the online only version to the online version of the journal. They don't get print subscriptions, uh, and so we've made it very easy, very friendly for them for them to be part of it. But we can do that only because we have enough revenue from other sources to keep the society going. Another society I'm familiar with, which is roughly the same size, the Society for the Study of Evolution, has been less aggressive in, in um, trying to recruit and retain its student membership and has kept its dues, student dues at a more traditional $35 to $40 a year. And actually, they're losing both, both full-time professional membership and student membership, largely because 
they, there is less loyalty to the society per se, and they can get the papers they need to see online anyway. And that's, that's true of many societies. And, and so it, it does say that there is a real challenge for societies here, um, regardless of whether there's open access or paid access through libraries, that if the, if the materials are available online to people, um, that the societies have to find new ways to appeal to their membership that go beyond simply getting the journal. Thank you. And Steve's going to comment as well. Uh, and I think that, you know, to add to what Kent said, I think in sci small scientific societies, we rely on volunteers and service for the peer review process. And without student membership and that feeling the need to pay back, articles don't just appear. The review process is pretty hefty and time consuming for lots of individual scientists. And if they don't feel the need because there's no loyalty to a society or to a journal, it's easy now, especially with electronic reviewing, no. You don't even have, used to be, you know, the article would show up on your desk and you felt this need to clear off your desk and get it done. But now you can just say no, and if there's no loyalty, um, you, there's no need to review. Without a review process, there's no journals. There's no need to have scientific journals if it's without a review process. And I think that that gets, and I, we don't pay anybody. It's all volunteer and, you know, it's self-fulfilling. You say no or you do a lousy job, you don't get asked back. The young folks do great jobs in reviewing articles because it means something to them. And I think the cheaper and the reduced cost of membership and easy access to the journal is our only way of paying them. Thank you. Do we have another question? Ann. Well, it seems to me that the societies actually have a whole different set of issues going on that has nothing to do with open access. I think if you talk to a lot of individuals who are involved in organizations of almost any kind, whether it's the local garden club or the society that represents their discipline, they will tell you that many of these organizations are faced with declining membership, declining levels of participation as people have taken their time to other things. Their lives are busier. So I'm concerned that the societies are looking at, at open access and saying that's the big threat to us. Because I think, in fact, OA may present a challenge, but it is not the only concern that you should have with attracting and maintaining memberships. The second point that I would make is that it seems to me that some societies, and I, I hope not to generalize, have become kind of like our state governments who have become dependent on the, the income that they get from the lottery. That what became a noble, we will use this money for education and all good things, now is an income stream to be used to support all the stuff that state government must do. And I think that this is something the societies have fallen into as well. They look at that 50% of their financial base coming from institutional subscriptions. And they don't want to risk that threat. But you are asking a whole lot of organizations that don't have any e other connection with your society to support the mission of your society. Right. Kent, did you hear the question? I, I could get pieces of it, but could you maybe just, I yes, heard there were I'll, two pieces. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to recap. It was a two-part question, um, and correct me if I get off track. The first part is that um, the decline in membership is society-wide and across many kinds of right. membership organizations. Mm -hmm. So tying it to OA is perhaps not the whole story. Oh, right, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the, the second part is... Um, I think this is maybe, I think you were the one that showed half of your income comes from institutional subscriptions. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, she was saying that kind of like state and federal government, um, societies have gotten accustomed to having that large share of income coming from institutions that only have a marginal relationship to your particular discipline okay. and that maybe yeah. you should rethink that. Okay, yeah, okay, I'll, yeah, I'd be happy to address both those points. First, 
um, the, the, the person who asked the question is absolutely right, that the, the decline in memberships is not specifically related to open access. I, I tried to say that, but it may not have come through. The decline in membership to the, to the extent it's associated with publication practices at all is associated with a change to online availability of publications rather than open access per se. Because many members, I know uh, a number of people, for example, I'm also a member of the Genetic Society of America, and I know a number of people who used to be members of the Genetic Society of America who canceled their membership once the journal became available online at their institutions. And so it was just a matter of they were members because they needed to get access to the journal. They no longer to be, need to be members to get access, and so they stopped. And that's independent of whether the journals are open access or not. So that's, I, I agree with absolutely. With respect to whether societies have become complacent with respect to the degree to which they depend on institutional subscription, I, I, there is, I think there is some degree of complacency. Um, having said that, I, there, are, there are two things I would say about that. First, as Steve said, many of the societies other than the really big ones like the American Chemical Society, the American Physical Society, or AAAS, are almost or entirely volunteer run. So that there are people like me who are faculty members at university who have full-time jobs teaching and research. And then in addition, we do this service to the society and try to make it run. And there simply aren't enough hours in the day for us to think creatively about alternative business models, or, and, and, or at least there haven't been. So that's one, one just sort of functional challenge. The second thing I would remind you of is, is that, in fact, the, the journals and, and is to dis, distinguish a bit among professional societies in their behavior towards publication. Because there are certainly some professional societies that we could all think of, the large prof ones with pro with large professional staffs and very fancy buildings in Washington D.C., who behave as if they were commercial publishers, and then there are other society publishers, like I think the society that Steve represents and the societies I've been involved with, that are either independently published or, unfortunately, one of the ones I used to be involved with is now published by Wiley Blackwell, which I, I was very disappointed when they went that way, but still a relatively small society. And so, as I say, the, the American Journal of Botany, to take one particular example, an institutional subscription to any institution is less than $700 a year for one of the most highly cited journals in the field of plant biology and it is barely half the price of journals published by Wiley Blackwell what, uh, or other commercial journals. And so, while it's true we depend on that income, it's also true we provide a very good value. And if the Botanical Society ceased to exist, which it would if the, we, we didn't have those other programs, you'd have to pay a lot more to get the same content. Thank you, Kent. Um, I'm going to ask our our first set of speakers, our society speakers, to come back to the front so we can have 15 minutes of questions with all of you. Um, Kent, I, yeah. I'll introduce you virtually to your fellow panelists. Um, you've already met Steve and Michael. This right. is Bob and Ken. So I will. So I will try to be very careful and say Ken or Kent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, yeah, Ken. Ken is going to comment. Just, just back to the the membership question. It's it's um, just even out of the realm of academic uh, to scientific and technical publications, just membership in general. But when I was in uh, graduate school in the 1980s, um, there wasn't a question as to whether I would be a member of the American Meteorological Society. The application was stuck in front of my face by my advisor. I was told to write out a check and send it in. And uh, almost all of the faculty were members of the AMS. This is the Department of Meteorology at Penn State, a big program. And it's things have just changed, and now, uh, a very small percentage of the uh, fa faculties or, or meteorology faculties are members of the AMS. And people want to know what's in it for me. What, what do I get out of it? And I don't want to be judgmental about that. I think it's a really good question. And it gets back to what Kent 
said earlier, that societies have to start thinking about other benefits to members beyond publications. It can't just be hinged to that. So that was my point. Thank you. Well, there are a couple of things I could, I mean, I could take the direction to talk about the role of aggregators, nonprofit like BioOne, and commercial like ProQuest and EBSCO, in um, also contributing to the decline in publisher subscriptions, but that's not really OA. Um, so I think I won't do that. That means somebody else needs to ask a question. Hillary. Yeah. And Alita will bring you the mic. I'm going the wrong way. My question is about uh, back files, digitizing back files and making those open access. Bob, I, I know you at the APS have done some of that, I, I believe. Uh, all of it, yes. Uh, and I was wondering if the other uh, panelists could comment on uh, whether that's something, a direction that you might go in if you're not already doing so, and if so, what the funding model for that kind of project would be. Uh, we've done it back to issue one, volume one, um, through the current issue. Uh, it was part of our, and I think that Kent alluded to this, part of our subscription fees, regardless of how we pay for the journal, helps other educational costs. And we funded the digital, digital it's like meteorological. <laughs> All right, we put everything on, on, online, um, going back to uh, volume one, issue one, and we self-funded that. Yeah, and our, our modest little journal for, uh, has uh, all of our archived articles digitized, and uh, the Boston College Library uh, provided that service, uh, and it was no cost to us. Uh, and, I, and I funded that out uh, five years ago to find out what that would be, and it was a prohibitive cost even five years ago. Um, so again, thank you to the right. uh, library partners. Right, and while we're waiting for the mic to reach Ken, um, in Steve's case, I suspect Highwire was able to get a great digitizing cost for you because they sort of serve as an, um, as an aggregator, or did you do it independently? I think they helped us with the bid process, and they got you overseas. Okay, so Highwire helped with the bid process and found an overseas provider, so... So, yeah, we're digitized um, all the way back to 1862, um, and uh, the, the project was very expensive. It was about $400,000 to do, and so for a number of years, we did charge for the, we call it the legacy collection, but with the promise that once that was paid for, we would stop charging for it. Now, in contrast to that, we have the Massachusetts Turnpike which some of you drive on. And that was also based on the same model. Once the road was paid for, which by the way was 30 years ago, the tolls would go away. Well, they haven't gone away, but our tolls have gone away. Yeah. That is interesting. I've done some pricing work for um, client publishers, and most of the commercial publishers will not sell you a back file. You may only subscribe to it. Yeah. You know, you get your perpetual access for whatever you've subscribed to, but a back file is not perpetual access. No. Um, Kent, would you like to comment on the back file question from any of your multiple perspectives? Yeah, well, so, so the, the back file, um, so BioOne doesn't provide back files per se. It provides only access to content from the time publishers joined. Um, the three societies I've been most deeply involved with all have complete back files to volume one, number one, because they, they're through JSTOR. And so JSTOR did the digitization. As a matter of fact, if you look at the issues of, of evolution from 1996 back, those are all my personal copies that were digitized. Um, that, uh, that, it does raise an, uh, a related issue that I thought I'd mention, though, uh, that I think we too frequently ignore in talking about open access, which is that there are styles. Namely, for example, um, the Botanical Society of America, we make all issues of the American Journal of Botany available 
one year after the pu publication, free of charge, so that anybody anywhere in the world can access the journal, regardless of whether they have a subscription, if they simply wait one year. That for us actually works pretty well. I suspect it would work well for many scientific societies that that would simultaneously preserve subscription income and provide wide access at some with some delay. Thank you. Do we have an yes? Um, Ellen so needs. Mm. We've been talking a lot about um, societies moving potentially to open access journals, uh, but I'm wondering if all of you that have been on the various panels could address the issue of allowing authors to do self-archiving of their manuscripts um, immediately in, in repositories, both subject and institutional repositories and personal websites, because we see a wide range of responses from societies about whether that seems very threatening to them and they prohibit it, or whether they've been allowing it for many years, as I know the APS has, um, without seeming any impact on their business model. I can uh, address it first. Uh, we've adopted a self-archiving policy, a pro-archiving policy in 1994. And we allow authors to archive and put online their version of the manuscript anywhere. Uh, up until recently, we allowed them to put online in their institution or their own website the APS published version of the article. Uh, and now with the Creative Commons thing, you can put it anywhere and anybody can do it. But we've always been in favor of uh, self-archiving. And by the way, back in the earlier conversation, the journals program of the American Physical Society is almost completely independent of the rest of the society as far as finances are concerned. Although we do purchase, you know, overhead kind of things. You know, the, personnel and, and so forth, but for the most part, meetings, APS programs, and so forth are not funded by the journals. And we have 170 people working on the journals. Right. Why don't we come this way and then I'll come around. Uh, right now, uh, you can put a copy of the article on a personal website, but university depositories, you need to pay the open access charge. Uh, and primarily, according to our copyright attorneys, we hold, the journal holds the copyright, and that's an issue. Uh, whether we address it in the future or not, um, I think it depends on people's loyalties. You know, I think if you take an assistant professor, they got to guess whether they're going to be at that institution long enough to worry about where they keep the archived copy. Uh, I've been publishing in the Journal of Animal Science since 1982, and I've never had an issue with having access to my data. Uh, and now with email, an author can send me a request to use their information, and unless it's a Friday at 6 o'clock uh, on the East Coast, because that's when they close up shop in Indiana, uh, they'll have access to their own material within 24 hours. And although the night journal does not represent a society, it, it is the only journal of Catholic education in North America that addresses issues K through higher ed. Um, and we also have established a, a principle by which the author has um, uh, has the favorable co copyright availability. So we, we allow any and all requests from the author uh, to have access um, in whatever format. I just gave uh, official approval for uh, uh, it wasn't the author's own uh, website, but it was to actually publish in an edited volume of, of issues related to his article, and we gave permission as well. And there's no cost, it's just a matter of sort of um, appropriate protocol to, to follow. Sure. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've, we've allowed self archiving for as long as I've been there. and. Um, also, uh, in small servers and departments and that kind of thing. So, and it has not affected us adversely in terms of our business model. Okay. Do we have another question? Oh, one one more point from Mom, point and then Deborah has. From APS, uh, some of our journals are a hundred percent archived before they're published. Uh, yet, 
the subscription model seems to work, the citations work, the downloads work. I don't know. Whatever people want, we'll do it. Um, would any of the panelists care to pick it? Pick a year, maybe 10 years or 20 years, and tell me what your thoughts are on whether you think there will be still be journals as we know them, and whether libraries will be paying for them. Okay. Kent, I'm going to pick on you. Yeah. <laughs> so you can start us off. Um. I, so I guess if, if maybe it's just because I have had difficulty predicting the future, but it's hard for me to imagine a future in which something more or less equivalent to journals does not exist, because I mean, the the function of communication for which they were originally created can be largely substituted with blogs and on online archives. Um, and certainly there are fields like physics, you know, where the archive, preprint archive, plays a tremendous role, or in economics, the same way. And the, the published journal pays, pays, plays less of a role. But, but academics is also a very conservative profession. And the, the sort of certification that publication in peer-reviewed journals plays, both for tenure and promotion, but also for the role that peer review plays in how public policy is determined. Just think about the debates that have happened with respect to climate change and the different impression you would get if you read the peer-reviewed literature on climate change versus if you get read what's in the blogs and which of those we should base public policy decisions on. There would be some role for something like journals and peer review, I, as far as I can see, into the distant future. And it would seem to me libraries will have to play some role in ensuring that that exists, whether that can, and whether it's a subscription model in which libraries play a role as consumers, or a, an author pays model in which libraries help um, faculty authors to publish their work. One way or another, institutions like uh, universities are going to have to remain committed to ensuring that the products of their research is widely available. Thank you. At the American Neurological Society, we're supposed to be able to predict something. <laughs> um, but I don't know that it extends to this question. However, I will say that when VHS came out, that was the death of movie theaters. Uh, but that didn't quite work out. Um, and uh, the newspaper is supposed to be dead a long time ago. I just picked up a copy of the Wizard Telegram. Um, and print should have been dead six or seven years ago, according to what I, what I was hearing. So I agree with everything that Kent said. And, and just look at other predictions about how things have, would disappear and, and apply it to this case. When I first came to APS, the editor-in-chief, Ben Peterson, said to me that, uh, you know, if the journals aren't worth doing, we don't see any reason to do it. However, the dissemination and the peer review and so forth and the insertion into the corpus of literature seem to be worth it so far, so we'll do it. Uh, following uh, Ken's analogy, the uh, cylindrical record doesn't really hang around too much anymore, and you can't go buy one. In fact, you can't even go to Tower Records and buy a record, but you can buy all the music you want on iTunes. And so the point of that is that information, whether it's music, physics research, anybody else's research, is still a viable entity in the world of science, and somehow we're going to do it. Uh, will it be the printed journal? Well, no. Uh, will it be the letters of these uh, uh, scientific society? Well, probably not, although there is, is a lot of that. Will it be blogs? Some. But something will be there, and I think it's the role of the society to be involved in it, to make it happen, and to do it. And uh, as my other editor-in-chief said, we asked, when will print die? He would say five years. The next year, he would say five years. <laughs> the next year, he would say five years, and he did that for 10 years. 
we're still fronting. And by the way, we'll continue to front as long as anybody wants it. So. Uh, my thought on the prediction, I'll, I'll leave it to my colleagues here who are much smarter and kind of know what's going on in the future of print. Um, but I do agree that uh, the, uh, the receptacle of scholarship, the communication of good peer-reviewed scholarship, um, was, I, I believe, uh, to a great degree uh, on the institutions, on our universities and colleges to, uh, to look for new ways to do that. Um, I will comment in terms of predicting the future. From my own experience with this journal is that uh, since we've gone open access and now that we have sort of a new impetus to, to think about how it is that we can utilize this new exposure, um, our managing editor's position and our staff positions will their job uh, sort of content and the skills with which they need to perform are going to change drastically. So I just did a search for a new managing editor and the qualifications for that person are significantly different from when I did the search for the managing editor even three years ago. So someone who is much savvier, content-based, but also knows how to do electronic um, and has a better sense of the marketing with regard to electronic. And we also can work with authors not only on editorial content, but how can we think of new modes um, of expressing our data and our conclusions. So I'm trying to push our managing editor uh, I don't want to push him, but push our, our, our authors to think more expansively about multimedia types of presentations of their, uh, of their work. So an um, online static journal is not interesting to me, and I don't think that's going to move us to the next level. It's more interactive, dialogical, conversational, multimedia, a lot of color, video, in, you know, I, I think that's sort of uh, the, the new way that we're thinking about our, our publishing experience in the next 10 years. I think what's important in 20 years, I'm going to be retired and I'm not going to worry about it that much. <laughs> uh, I, I think it'll change. Um, I think that we can't look at a library as a silo. Universities and creators of data or their bosses will in some way have to contribute to the costs of creating and disseminating information. Um, I think at our institution, and I have this discussion with Carolyn on a regular basis and the library committee, uh, it's a silo and it's a matter of which budget's going to help pay for the publication or the dissemination of the data in whatever way that dissemination occurs. And as institu within institutions fight over budgets, those silos are created, and that's really what has to change, is the model to support research and to support the dissemination of the research. Because if we fall victim to the blogs, I think Kent's point was very important. Bloggers can be well heard without having any data. And that'll be the death of our fields and not really good for our policy makers or for the for our future, I think, as we make policy based on real peer-reviewed data. Okay, well, I want to conclude us with a little more optimistic note. Um, you know, I think in the information explosion, more and more content out there, we're trying to come up with better, richer metadata and more discoverability and all of that. Well, the editorial process that gets good stuff into the pipeline first, I think will get even more important and we'll find ways of recognizing that and supporting it going forward. So I want to thank Deborah Linares for a terrific closing question. Thank all of our speakers, our organizers, and all of you. We're going to go into lunch now, but thank you very much.